Corn Battlefield National Monument, site of one of the most famous battles in American history, the Battle, <clears throat> pardon me, of the Little Bighorn. Named for the Little Bighorn River, flows here through the river valley, right down below you in the tree lines down below. The last great battle in a 400 year clash of cultures that began in colonial times. But the more immediate roots of the problem came from the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, which basically gave, <coughs> pardon me, the Sioux and the Cheyenne the right to roam freely in the so-called unceded territories, eastern Wyoming, eastern Montana, as long as the buffalo shall roam. In addition to which, it gave the Sioux sole ownership of the uh, Black Hills, sacred bountiful hunting grounds. The Black Hills is to belong to the Sioux forever. Forever lasted about five years. Mm -hmm. Then what happens? The Boom. great economic collapse, 1873. Banks fail, unemployment sky high, people are homeless and hungry. The next year, gold is discovered in the Black Hills. Thousands of miners head to the Black Hills. Now this presents a conundrum for President Ulysses S. Grant. Do we send the army in to uh, keep the miners out? Well, we don't want to do that, you know. It's a great economic stimulus. Okay, so do we send the uh, my, or the army in to uh, protect the miners from the angry Sioux. Well, they are violating the treaty. What are we going to do? Let's buy the uh, Black Hills back. However, negotiations fail. Uh, finally, in um, exasperation, Pre President Ulysses Simpson Grant egged on by some hawks in the War Department as well as rich investors back east. Uh, they decide, let's be done with this so-called, quote, his words, not mine, folks, Indian problem. For some under res order them onto reservations. <clears throat> if they don't go, we'll force them on, uh, send the army in to do the job. So to that end, three great armies are sent into the field to find, round up the Sioux and the Cheyenne, for some under reservations. Out of the south, uh, from Wyoming, General George Crook with a thousand soldiers, including 300 uh, or so uh, Crow and Shoshone Indian scouts. Yes, Crow and Shoshone Indians, longtime enemies of the Sioux and the Cheyenne, felt they had to ally themselves with the whites to survive. As a matter of fact, no matter what road you took to get here today, you had to drive through what is now what was the day of the battle? What was uh, 200 years before the battle? Crow Indian land. So the Crow looked at the Sioux and the Cheyenne as trespassers, interlopers on their land. Uh, they wanted them gone, okay? Out of the uh, west, Bozeman, Montana, Colonel John Gibbon with 500 infantry. And out of the east, Bismarck, North Dakota, Fort Abraham Lincoln, General Alfred H. Terry, with a thousand soldiers, including all 12 companies of the U.S. 7th Cavalry, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. So, uh, uh, the very first battle in this war uh, actually was fought in March of uh, 1876, about 100 miles from where you're standing, along the Powder River. Uh, Custer didn't even leave Fort Abraham Lincoln till May the 17th. So the war had been going on for a couple of months before Custer ever took the field. Eight days before Little Bighorn, on a place called the Rosebud, about 30 miles from where you're standing, General Crook is attacked by Crazy Horse. By the end of the day, casualties are relatively light on both sides. That may be a dozen, two dozen people killed on both sides. Uh, at the end of the day, though, Crook, he goes hightailing it out of there. Crook does. He goes back to Wyoming where he came from. He wants more men. He wants more ammunition. He wants more men. He wants more supplies. Did I say he wanted more men? <laughs> he wants no part of Crazy Horse with only a thousand soldiers. However, Crook makes no effort to find Terry and Gibbon or Custer. Uh, send uh, messages through to try to tell them where the Indians are, 
how many there are, and they are in a mood to fight. The morning of uh, Sunday, June 25th, 1876, a high point in the uh, uh, Wolf Mountains, about 15 miles from where you're standing. We call it the Crow's Nest. Custer's Indian Scouts, Crow and Arikari Indians. What, Arikari Indians too? Yes, another tribe, longtime enemies of the Sioux and the Cheyenne. I decided to help the soldiers under the premise, any enemy of my enemy is my friend. They, just, they tell Custer, uh, look, there's a big Indian village on the Little Bighorn, but they give him conflicting information. Some say, more Indians than you can kill in a day. Others say, you attack, you'll go home by a road you do not know. In other words, you're not going to be alive when you take it, okay? <laughs> but others tell him, you've got to attack now. The Indians are scattering and running. Now, Custer was obsessed with the idea of the Indians scattering and running. Uh, that's because in time of war, it was almost impossible to find an Indian village. Uh, basically, any time the army was near, the village would pick up, scatter, and move. Uh, not because the warriors were cowards, but because the safest, most efficient, and practical way to keep the women and children and non-combatants safe, get them out of harm's way. Nonetheless, Custer decides to keep his men and horses hidden up in the hills uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, he wants to give them time to rest, get something to eat. Uh, he also especially wants to give the scouts time to reconnoiter. Uh, wants to know exactly uh, where the Indian village is, how big it is, uh, the lay of the land, good places to ford the river, etc. But then he, received, he plans, uh, by the way, to ride out at night, surround the village at dark, attack at dawn the, first, uh, uh, the next morning. Then, however, he receives what he believes is credible evidence. The uh, command's been spotted. He feels he has no choice but to attack immediately. He feels if uh, he doesn't, the village will be gone. Uh, by the next morning. And after all, he is sent out here to find and round up the, uh, uh, the Indians, not to let them all get away while he's uh, taking a nap somewhere 15 miles away. He gives the orders to attack. Now, Custer has to conduct because uh, he doesn't really know exact location, lay of the land. He has to conduct what you would call a reconnaissance in force. He splits his command four ways. He leaves 125 soldiers to uh, guard this slow-moving mule pack train. Uh, has all the uh, food for the men, forage for the horses, extra ammunition. Has to be protected at all costs. He also sends Captain Fred Benteen on a scouting mission to the south. He wants to make sure Indians aren't uh, fleeing uh, south along the Little Bighorn. He also wants to make sure there's no uh, satellite villages that could come and attack him from the rear. Now, quick geography lesson before we proceed. As I told you, Little Bighorn River uh, flows right through the valley here in the trees, right down below you. If you follow that tree line, it, uh, uh, there's a gap in the tree line right down here, and you can just make, barely make out a white ranch house here in the foreground. That's about where the north end of the village was that day. It extends along the valley floor south about a mile and a half. It's about a half mile wide, or generally speaking, from about the interstate over to the uh, uh, river. It's an estimated, uh, most historians say maybe seven, 8,000 Indians, perhaps 1,500, maybe as many as 2,000 Indians. Uh, so. Major Marcus Reno is sent to attack the south end of the village. Reno makes his attack from about five miles south of where you're standing. He comes around the trees toward the south end of the village. Now you often hear Custer stupidly and foolishly rode into a trap here at Little Bighorn. Everybody knows that's true, right? You see it in movies all the time. You see it on documentaries all the time. All this and that. You. Uh, didn't happen that way, folks. I'm here to tell you it didn't happen that way. Most warrior accounts agree. Uh, it was a hot, sweltering Sunday afternoon, about 100 degrees that day. Where was Crazy Horse when the soldiers uh, are spotted? 
He's doing what any normal human being would be doing on such a day. Something I would be doing. He's trying to beat the heat. He's cooling off in the cool waters of the Little Bighorn. Lots of non-combatants and warriors are doing the same thing. And when the uh, soldiers are spotted, there is fear, panic, chaos, pandemonium, confusion throughout the whole village. Women and children screaming, oh, we're all going to die. They begin fleeing up along the Little Bighorn River, up, up through the trees down here. Well, Sitting Bull, if he had his great trap planned, he didn't tell anybody because, uh, how do we know that? He has uh, one of his wives, has two young children, okay? And in her fear and this uh, whole uh, chaos and uh, panic, uh, she grabs one of the children and runs off. She's up running here along the little bighorn. One of her friends says, hey, where's the other child? Oh my God, she has to run back and get the child. Okay, after that, uh, the child's fine. They call that child the abandoned one. So Custer didn't ride into a trap here. Nonetheless, the warriors very, very quickly respond to the attack. Mrs. Spotted Tail Bull says, our warriors were uh, uh, riding through the village like the wind attacking the uh, oncoming soldiers. Reno says as he got near the village, uh, the ground seems to be growing Indians. Now Reno was a, a good Civil War soldier, but he does, never fought Indians before. He really doesn't know how to handle this. He stops, dismounts, form a skirmish line. He's being outflanked. He goes into a wooded area we call the timber. He's surrounded, he uh, turns to Bloody Knife. Bloody Knife is uh, Custer's favorite scout, an Arikara. Uh, so, hey, Bloody Knife, what am I gonna do here? What do you suggest? At that moment, pow, right in the head. Uh, Bloody Knife's head uh, shot right in the head. Uh, Reno's face is splattered with blood and gore. He loses it. According to uh, surviving soldiers, he begins screaming out what they call panicky contradictory orders. Mount! Dismount! Mount! Those of you who want to make our escape and live, follow me! He gets up on his horse. He rides pale mail out of the timber. No rear guard is sent out. No formal order to retreat is made. Men are, uh, one minute, they're fighting uh, the warriors. Next minute, they look around. Nobody left around them. It's a panic-stricken uh, route. Uh, warriors say how easy it was. Chase the uh, soldiers, killing them. Uh, pulling them from their horses as they flee toward the river, pulling them off the saddle as they're drag struggling across the river, uh, shooting them from behind as they scale the steep bluffs. Reno loses 40 men. He gets up to the steep bluffs uh, about four and a half miles from where you're standing. You see those twin peaks about three miles out yonder, about a mile and a half past that. Uh, Reno gets to the top of the bluffs. He gets up to the top of the bluffs, he's, and Benteen comes riding up. Now, Benteen has received urgent orders to join Custer immediately. The last message from Custer to Benteen reads, Benteen, come on, big village, be quick. Bring packs, P.S., bring packs, the ammunition packs. So you got to keep two things in mind when you uh, uh, try to figure out the rest of the battle heel here. First... Custer almost assuredly doesn't know that Reno has been so badly whipped, he's no longer a threat. That leaves all 1,500 to 2,000 warriors free to come up and attack Custer's men. Custer definitely doesn't expect Benteen not to follow orders and join him immediately. But Benteen, when he rides past Reno at the top of the bluffs there, uh, as he rides past, Reno says, my God, Benteen, I've lost half my men. You gotta stop and help me. Re Benteen does stop and help. For the next hour and a half, the two soldiers, despite uh, gunfire being heard, make no effort to ride to the sound of the firing. Finally, an hour and a half, maybe a little longer later, a pack train has arrived. Only then is a very half-hearted, disjointed effort made to ride to the sound of the firing. Soldiers get to those twin peaks, again, about three miles uh, out yonder where, from where you're standing. All they see from up here, billowing clouds of dust, billowing clouds of gun smoke. Warriors riding around, shooting at objects on the ground. Warriors spot them, they attack them. 
Reno and Benteen fall back, form a defensive position again, about four and a half miles from where you're standing, uh, back at what we call the Reno Benteen defense site, right at the end of the tour road. If you want to drive out there later, feel free. Uh, they are held under siege the rest of June 25th and throughout most of the June 26th before late afternoon. The firing uh, f uh, drops off and stops. That evening, the Indian village is seen picking up, moving toward the Bighorn Mountains to the south. The battle of the Little Bighorn's over, but what happened to Custer? Where was Custer? Now, I freely admit, when you start talking Custer's movements from here on in, exact certitude is not to be had. Nonetheless, what I think may, may have happened is this. Custer has five companies under his immediate command, 209 men under his immediate command, 210, of course, if you count Custer. We know he rides down to Medicine Tail Coulee. Medicine Tail is the drainage. Down below, you see the sun shimmering off a vehicle <laughs> down here. Uh, down below there is Medicine Tail Coulee. He rides uh, down toward the north end of the village. He is met by some uh, resistance. He does not cross the river. Uh, he eventually falls back, takes up a position up here, what we call Calhoun Hill. Cal Custer splits his command, uh, leaves three companies on Calhoun Hill to act as a rear guard and as a beacon for Benteen. Now, everything I'm talking about now, from Custer's time he gets down to Medicine Tail, Till he gets up here and everything. This is all takes time to develop. Uh, there's no grand Indian attacks like Hollywood at this point in the, the uh, uh, battle. Remember, uh, most of the warriors are five miles away. Take some time to get up, change, uh, get fresh horses some or ponies. Some get fresh ponies, others come up on foot. And they, uh, make, they use the draws, the coolies, the ravines, all the land, the terrain. Uh, and it's kind of guerrilla kind of fighting, opportunistic. Uh, few casualties on either side for the longest time. But more and more warriors are coming up all the time, right? Uh, now, three companies are fighting uh, uh, over here. You see where those vehicles are parked about halfway down the ridge? Uh, warriors are uh, mounting pressure there. Company C is sending a deliberate counterattack drives the warriors back uh, uh, to a ridge in front of them. Company C's take up position again where you see two vehicles parked about halfway down the ridge. There's uh, less than 40 soldiers, uh, maybe 38 soldiers in Company C uh, at that point over there. Uh, Company L is, being, uh, hell, is up on Calhoun Hill, maybe 40 some soldiers. Company I is split up. Uh, Company I, you see the vehicles parked along the ridge to the left, over the left side of the ridge. Uh, Company I is fighting. Those three companies are fighting over there. Custer takes two companies. So there's three companies, about 120 men roughly for those three companies. Custer then takes 80 men or 90, uh, counting the command staff, his two companies. Rides behind this ridge, uh, possibly down this drainage here. He goes down to the Little Bighorn River. Why? Most Indian or most historians now believe Custer's whole purpose at this point of the battle is to try to round up women and children to use as hostages, human shields. Why would he do that? Because the warriors are not going to attack uh, soldiers holding uh, women, children, not combatants hostage. Uh, that would leave the rest of the soldiers free to destroy the whole village, kill ponies. Basically, Custer thinks he can win the end the killing, end the bloodshed, end the violence, end the war right here and now. Now, he is either repulsed because more uh, enough time has elapsed, when enough warriors have come up this way, or he moves back uh, to wait for Benteen, right? Custer takes up a position in the National Cemetery area. That's the cemetery uh, in front of the parking lot where all the trees are, the visitor center. And that, folks, is a national cemetery, like Arlington. Has almost nothing to do with the Custer dead here, okay? <coughs> Pardon me. Company E is fighting in the national cemetery. 
pardon me. Company F comes down, is fighting along the trail here where some of those markers are. We call it the basin. Remember, three companies over there fighting. They're all split up. Now, more and more warriors, of course, are coming up here all the time. And pretty soon, uh, out of the deep ravine, uh, soon warriors are starting to come up more and more. Uh, soon they're starting to spew out of the deep ravine like lava from Mount Vesuvius. Who comes out of the deep ravine? Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse rides straight to the top of the ridge. He's going to do bravery runs. He's going to dare and show the warriors how brave he is and inspire them. Now, he has a trick up his sleeve. Crazy Horse knew he could never be shot by a white man. How does he know that? Because as merciless in battle as many of these tribes out were, especially the Sioux, and they were merciless in battle too, believe me. Uh, they did, thought nothing, for instance, of attacking uh, uh, other tribes or whites. It didn't matter. Uh, they wouldn't thought nothing of killing the women and children. Why? To terrorize them, strike fear and panic into their opponents, okay? Matter of fact, Crazy Horse, uh, the very first person he ever killed was a Winnebago woman. Yeah. Crazy Horse killed a woman. He didn't like to do it, but he did it. No big deal, really, to most of the people. But no matter how merciless they could be, they were very spiritual people. They believed in the Great Spirit. They believed the Great Spirit would appear to them. Visions and dreams help guide their lives if they, they would only listen to them. As a young uh, teenager, maybe 13, 14, Crazy Horse, whose father was a spirit, he was a good warrior, great warrior, but he was also very spiritual. The son picked up on that. Crazy Horse has uh, uh, dreams. The great spirit appears to him in a series of dreams, gives him a couple of basic messages. First, the great spirit tells him, you were put on this earth for one major reason, to be a protector of your people. He dedicates his entire life trying to do just that. Also, the Great Spirit tells him, if you do what I shall tell you, uh, you don't do things like taking battle trophies such as scalps. Now you have to realize in a nomadic warrior society, a man's whole social standing depends on his courage and accomplishments on the battlefield. So warriors always took uh, battle trophies such as scalps, other uh, parts of the human anatomy uh, to show how brave they were and what, uh, how they could accomplish things. Sitting Bull uh, had a trophy case of a, well, not a case, but had a collection of 60 to 70 uh, such trophies, according to some biographers. Nonetheless, the Great Spirit tells Crazy Horse, don't take battle trophies. If you do, you will ne if you do not, if you follow me, you will never be shot by a white man. So, Armed with this knowledge, Crazy Horse, and not for the first time in his life, rides up, in, probably along the road here. He begins riding back and forth in front of uh, soldiers, daring them, taunting them, uh, you know, to shoot him. Every soldier that opens up sees him, sees him, they open up. Ba -ba 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 Pow! No white man bullet ever hurt Crazy Horse. Now you can imagine, yeah. You're a warrior here, you know, got uh, uh, the soldiers outnumbered, and you got Crazy Horse, one of your leaders. Nobody can hurt him. And just think how fired up and inspired all these warriors are. Crazy Horse himself, he challenges White Bull. White Bull is Sitting Bull's nephew. Come on, join me or be a coward. Of course, White Bull doesn't, is no coward. He rides back and forth in front of the soldiers. Bow, 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 bow. They don't hurt him either. Just imagine how, hey, these guys can't hurt us. Our medicine is strong. About this time, lame white man, he's a Southern Cheyenne chief. I told you where Company C was about halfway down the ridge, about 250 yards in front of him, a ridge we call grassy, greasy grass ridge. Uh, there's several hundred warriors massed. Lame white man's one of them. He looks around. There's 35, 40 soldiers in front of him. Several hundred warriors. He says, come, it's a good day to die. We can kill them all. And he leads probably 
the only Hollywood style Grand Indian attack of the whole Custer portion of the battle. They sweep up over Company C. Half of Company C's uh, wiped out. The other half go fleeing for their lives up toward Calhoun Hill. Uh, now, about this same time, either side of Calhoun Hill on drainages under Gall, Two Moons, Crow King, Little Dog, others, they sweep up like a tidal wave over Company L on Calhoun Hill. All of a sudden, now remember, Custer, up till the uh, time uh, lame white man starts his charge, he's probably down here cursing Benteen. Hey, come on, get up here. Where are you? I can still win this battle if you just get up here with some reinforcements. Now it's all starting to fall apart very quickly. The whole right wing starts to fall like dominoes. Company C falls. Company L falls. Crazy Horse leads a charge up over the ridge, uh, sweeps down over Company I. Custer, seeing it all fall apart, knowing that his command's in trouble, he actually has to fight warriors off uh, this hill to move up here. When he gets up here, I think he wants to rally his shattering command. Out of the whole 120 man, three company right wing, maybe a dozen soldiers are left alive to join Custer. All of a sudden, Custer's lost three fifths of his command. He has less than 100 men left. And there are some indications he may have tried to pro be proactive. I mean, I'm guessing here based on uh, the evidence. For instance, uh, warrior testimony talk about anywhere from one to five horsemen on very fast horses seen leaving uh, the hill here, riding out toward uh, Reno and Benteen. Now, maybe they were just trying to escape, but you kind of guess that maybe, just possibly, Custer's trying to get one last message out to Benteen to get some help up here. It's a desperate situation. Custer then sends Company E down uh, go down here, back on the cemetery ridge, forms a skirmish line there. They dismount. Their horses are taken by horse holders. You see the drainage here uh, between the trail and the uh, cemetery. Uh, one, one soldier holding his four horses, maybe more. Uh, now, if you ever tried to control one uh, jumpy or spooky horse, you know, it's a very tough situation. Try holding four of them or more because every man uh, is needed on the firing line. About this time, John, Sta according to John Stans in Timber, John Stans in Timber is the grandson of Lame White Man. He's a, uh, also a Cheyenne historian. He tells us about the Suicide Boys, about 20 uh, Sioux and Cheyenne boys who probably too young to fight, maybe 13, 14. Uh, unbeknownst to the uh, elders in the village, they amongst themselves make a suicide pact. They decide if the so uh, village is attacked, they will fight to the death to protect it. According to John Stans in Timber, they suicide boys lead an attack, uh, quite likely or quite possibly uh, against the horse holders because the uh, horses are stampeded, horse holders die. Uh, a number, about that time, warriors overrun Company E. Company E goes fleeing for their lives down toward the deep ravine. They're joined by several men uh, running from Last Stand Hill up here, down into the deep ravine. Matter of fact, the last 28 soldiers left alive out of Custer's five companies probably died fleeing through the deep ravine down there. But nobody ever comes here to talk about the deep ravine. Y'all come here because of what happened here, up here on this lonely, windswept hillside, out in the middle of nowhere. This is where Custer and the remnants of his shattered command, maybe 41 soldiers left alive at that point, shoot and kill their horses, make that last stand a legend in history. Why do they shoot your horses? Hey, you're standing here. What's gonna stop a bullet? You gotta make breastworks, anything to stop a bullet, take cover, uh, maybe uh, anything to stay alive five more minutes. The warriors uh, don't like attacking a fortified position. Uh, maybe Benteen will get up here, uh, hopefully. Um, but if you're a cavalryman and you need your, you depend on your horse for everything, you know there's a couple things run through your mind. Uh, you're gonna lose all mobility, all man maneuverability, you're losing all means of escape, really. 
uh, and if you're about 400 some miles from home you know you ain't going home now the warriors again they go back to the op opportunistic fighting no seed need to uh, uh, attack a uh, fortified position and lose more warriors they again uh, begin uh, the uh, opportunistic guerrilla kind of fighting uh, uh, the uh, two moons talks about swirling around the hill up here like uh, wa uh, the uh, warriors were swirling around uh, like the water around a stone in the middle of a fast moving uh, stream, right? Uh, warriors, hundreds of war uh, arrows filling the air, silent death falling from the sky, soldiers running lower and lower in ammunition, till suddenly, in the words of Wooden Leg, Wooden Leg's an 18 year old uh, Cheyenne warrior. He's fighting about 250 yards behind you on the other side of the ridge. Wooden Leg says, the shots stop coming. Only then, hundreds of warriors, all four sides, they sweep up over the hill. It's over very, very quickly. How long does it take uh, the warriors from the time uh, Company C is attacked by lame white man till the time Custer and the men in deep ravine are dead? According to uh, two moons, about as long as it takes a hungry man to wolf down his dinner. Now, when it's all over, we knew know a couple of things. Custer and immediate, his immediate command are dead. 210 men, counting Custer. Uh, 53 others under Reno and Benteen are dead. 60 are wounded. Five of these later die of their battle wounds. Uh, uh, Indian casualty figures always uh, been guessed all over the ballpark. Uh, nobody's ever going to know how many for sure. Uh, guesses have always been from a dozen or so to 300 or more. Uh, the National Park Service, working with uh, the various tribes and families, uh, uh, has uh, the uh, put uh, about 58 names, I believe, over on the Indian Memorial there for warriors who died in this battle. Uh, most historians believe anywhere from 60 to 100, but nobody ever knows for sure. When it is over, though, a couple things we do know for sure. When it's over, the Native Americans have won their second greatest victory ever. Second greatest victory ever against any U.S. fighting force. What was the first? November the 4th, 1791 the border of present-day Ohio and Indiana, a place called the Wabash River. General Arthur St. Clair has about a thousand uh, soldiers and militiamen, accompanied by 300 women and children, families of the uh, soldiers and militiamen, uh, laundresses, women who made a living following soldiers. They were en route to attack a confederation of uh, Great Lakes uh, region uh, Indian tribes, uh, uh, basically uh, up there somewhere near Toledo, Ohio, present day Toledo, Ohio. They're sitting around uh, having breakfast. They are attacked. About two or three hours later, 630 soldiers are dead. Uh, 250 others are wounded. At least 30 women and children, likely more, uh, are killed. Another 50 to 150 are ca taken captive. It's called St. Clair's Defeat or the Battle of the Wabash, or, according to one historian, the victory of no, with no name. Why is that? Because obviously nobody's ever heard about it. The government, white America, tries to sweep it under the rug. We don't talk about it, it never happened, right? That kind of a deal. Uh, so, second greatest victory ever. Now, you're not gonna believe this, but Custer actually was right about one thing. When the uh, Indian, village picked up and scattered after this battle. More and more soldiers uh, came out here to try to round them up, force them under reservations. They spent the rest of the summer, the fall, the following uh, winter, and into the spring before May 1877. Crazy Horse surrenders, Sitting Bull flees into Canada with his followers. That is what finally ended the Great Sioux War of 1876-77. Also, this is certainly a classic case of winning a battle and losing a war. 
Now, this was a very great victory for the Warriors, a well-deserved victory for the Warriors. Shouldn't have surprised anybody that they could defeat the U.S. Cavalry because as many soldiers, including people like Custer, always acknowledged the Warriors were the greatest uh, uh, light cavalry in the world, okay? So, it was a great victory, a glorious victory, a well-deserved victory, okay? But, it was a victory, yes, this great victory, the last victory any Native Americans won against the U.S. Army, because it wasn't just a case of winning a battle and losing a war. This, unfortunately, as we all know today, is a case of winning this great battle and losing everything else. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you. Wow. A great audience. The question is, did Custer die of a bullet or arrow? Custer's body was found with two uh, bullet wounds. Uh, no arrows. Uh, well, none that were from his life, I'll explain. Um, Custer has two bullet wounds. Uh, one to the left side of the chest, one to the left temple. Either one of them could have been fatal. Uh, however, there are conflicting stories about whether the chest wound bled. If it did not bleed, that means it's a post-mortem wound. In other words, he was dead before he was shot in the chest, okay? Uh, there is a, uh, an arrow. Um, it was a uh, part of the mutilation afterwards. It was, uh, uh, an arrow was found in his um, reproductive area, shall we say. Oh, that's a wrap.